the contradictory narcissist. Contradictions about turns, doing one thing and meaning another. Those are staple ingredients, of course, in becoming entangled with our kind. Of course, the lesser and the mid-range of our kind do not see the contradictions. They are blinded to it by their narcissism. To them, their behaviour makes absolute sense, even though, when it is viewed from your perspective, there is a clear contradiction in what has been said or done. This is probably one of the most maddening aspects of being involved with the narcissist is that you can see that we are hypocrites, that we are contrarians, that we have said one thing and then completely gone against it in the next. And yet how can we not? You believe that on the inside we're laughing at you, that we can see that what we have done is contrarian. Well, that is true with regard to the greater and the ultra. We know that what we have said contradicts ourselves but we don't care and we are so accomplished at denying that this is the case and bamboozling you with an appropriate word salad or glossing over the matter with charm and largesse that we are able to get away with it lesser and mid-ranger don't see that they've done anything wrong because their narcissism operates in these small compartments of each second and what is done in the first second can be completely at odds with what is done next, but the narcissism prevents the narcissist from seeing this. You can see it, they can see it, but the lesser and mid-range narcissist can't. And the more that you try and point this out to the narcissist that they have behaved in a contradictory way, all you're doing is providing the narcissist with challenge fuel. You're giving fuel, which is what the narcissist wants, but you're challenging the narcissist by suggesting that he's wrong, that he's a contrarian, that he's made a mistake, and therefore that threatens the narcissist's innate and unconscious sense of control, which means that you are met with the denials and all the other manipulations which come to the fore as part of ensuring that this threat to control is nullified. You spend your time trying to get us to see that we have contradicted ourselves. Driven by your inherent truth-seeker trait as part of being an empath, which is hijacked by your elevated emotional thinking, you try again and again and again to point out to us that we have contradicted ourselves. You will get nowhere. The lesser or mid-ranger can't see it and believe that their behaviour makes perfect sense. The greater and the ultra can see it, but will not make any such concession, because to do so would be to provide power to you. And of course, we must never, ever do that. This contradictory behaviour invariably frustrates, upsets and infuriates you as you attempt us to make us see that you are correct and we are not, or to try and make us see that we have behaved in a contradictory or hypocritical fashion you won't succeed. The lesser and the mid-range narcissists don't do this deliberately. It's just how they are. The lesser reacts. The mid-range narcissist operates instinctively by denying and deflecting and can observe that the more upset and frustrating that you get equates to somehow feeling better. Of course, the narcissist that is mid-range doesn't truly know why he feels better based upon your upset and just thinks that it is a consequence of being able to prove you wrong by denying your assertions. The mid-range narcissist doesn't know that he needs fuel, but he does experience feeling better as a consequence of your reactions. He also recognises that he doesn't like to be held to account, but he doesn't know the real reason why that is. He recognises that he doesn't want to be the one who is to blame, but he doesn't again understand precisely why that is. He will not accept any suggestion of contradictory behaviour, because it is inherent with such an accusation that there is blame attached, and we must always shift the blame onto you. The greater and the ultra know that to twist, to turn, to shift and to alter allows the emotional responses to flow from you that the fuel flows freely, and that control 
is asserted over you and your threat to control is nullified. We must betray control and superiority at all times, otherwise we find ourselves in a position of damnation. The greater an ultra revel in switching from one position to the other within moments and then seeing if you dare to point out the shift in stance. Should you do so, of course, the greater or the ultra will deny and deflect in order to frustrate you, to upset you and to alarm you. This contradictory behaviour, of course, is part of the process of gaslighting, an insidious and effective method of controlling you, eroding your sense of perspective and forcing you ever backwards and until ultimately you know nothing other than our warped truth, yours having been dispelled some time ago. Our narcissism endeavours to make you a stranger to your own reason, and in so doing allows us to assert control over you. Contradictory behaviour is prevalent in your ensnarement with the narcissist, and particularly so during the commencement of your devaluation, whether it is a sustained devaluation where you are the intimate partner primary source, or corrective devaluations where you are a secondary source. I will now provide you with five common examples of contradictory behaviour so that you know what to look out for and why it's happening. Number one, the joy has gone. We once showed such enthusiasm for Indian cuisine and would often try to find the latest and most exciting restaurant for us both to go to. It might have been the zealous delight that we exhibited at the prospect of going hill walking with you or discussing the latest production at the local theatre. You loved how we connected over these apparent shared interests. Of course, it was all mirroring. We love what you love in order to draw you in. Now, at the point of devaluation, there's no need to do it anymore. We care little for Indian cuisine, but since you loved it so much, well, at the time, we decided to do so as well. Hill walking is actually tedious now. The only thing that we liked about it was being on top of the world. As for theatre, if we have to sit through another obscure play, we will explode. Still, it was worth making you think that we loved all of those things as it made you easier to bind to us, easier to control, easier to extract fuel from. And now, if you keep listing everything that you think we have in common as part of your devaluation, we will deny that we were ever interested in it or that we only did it to keep you happy and that actually we can't stand it. Now that you're viewed black, all of the things that you like, we must find fault with. Number two, the compliments end. We embedded you as the provider of the positive fuel, and you function well, so you earned those further compliments. Now, you have lost the right to receive those compliments, and therefore there is no need to provide them. The greater or, not, greater or ultra will be aware that you look even better than you did when we first met, and that you continue to try hard to tease the compliments from us, in order to try to stave off that nagging fear that you are losing us. But it is to no avail. We will still remove the compliments for you and replace them with insults. The lesser and the mid-range narcissist cannot accept that the compliments were ever given meaningfully, and again will suggest that they were never provided or only given to keep you quiet, or that because you were making the effort then and you no longer are, even though... To any other observer, you can be seen to be making just as much, if not more, effort. From the perspective of the lesser or mid-range narcissist, they honestly believe that you've let yourself slide. They believe that you've let yourself go, that you're not making the effort, that you're making the wrong choices, and will even go so far as to accuse you of doing it deliberately to provoke. Where have these compliments gone? They're removed from you, and they're now given to somebody else, your prospective replacement. Number three, a sudden realisation. The narcissist may well say to you, actually, I love my ex. You have made me realise this. I thought I did not know what love was until I met you. I vaguely remember saying something like this to you some time ago, but come to think of it, 
I knew all along, and it is my ex that I love, not you. And thank you for the distraction whilst I work things out. What's that? You, you say I said that she was abusive and a psycho. No, that never happened. There you are. You've just proven in that comment why I cannot love someone like you. Goodbye. There is, of course, no sudden realisation. It is not the case that we actually do love the ex, and no longer love you. We never loved them, and we never loved you. But in the mind of the lesser or mid-range narcissist, the narcissism convinces them that they actually never stop loving those individual, that individual, and therefore it is entirely appropriate for the purposes of triangulation and control of, de of you by devaluation to point out that we still do love them and we actually don't love you. The greater and the ultra know what is going on, but revel in doing this as a purpose for the purposes of, of punishing you because of our perception that you have let us down, that you are the traitor, that you are treacherous. Number four, but you thought I hated that. Why have I now decided to go to that classical concert when I once said to you that I couldn't stand classical music? Once again, we are exhibiting the contradictory behaviour, and it works both ways. The things that we once said that we like, we now said that we don't, and vice versa. Those things that we said that we hated, we now actually really enjoy. The reason being, to provoke you, and it's quite possibly the case that the individual that is now being courted as your replacement is being mirrored because they like the classical music. Should you point out this contradiction, of course, it will be denied through the first line of the twin lines of the narcissistic defence. We will tell you to stop telling us what we like and what we don't like. We will accuse you of being so controlling. We will deny that we said that we didn't like reading. We've always enjoyed reading books. And where on earth did you get the idea from that we didn't? Of course I love strawberries. They're delicious and I love eating them. I never told you that I was allergic to them. Stop making things up. You need some help. You keep twisting things around. And I don't like that. There you are. That is something that I hate. What you do to me. Once again, this feeds into the gaslighting. We once stated, as we mirrored you, that we didn't like a particular thing. And now we very much enjoy it. And of course deny that we ever said that we hated it. Number five. The sudden complaints. Must we really go to your parents this weekend? So what if I've never complained about it before? That doesn't matter. I'm complaining now. And the reason is, of course, is that you're in devaluation. And we want to provoke you and isolate you from your parents. We suspect that they don't like us or that they have somehow cottoned on to the fact that we aren't all that we seem. And we're not going to let them put ideas in your head. They have gone on the blacklist and therefore... They will be smeared, in effect, as we assert control over them indirectly, as we also assert control over you by triangulating you with your parents by saying we no longer want to go and visit them. We are also instinctively where lesser and mid-range and consciously aware where greater and ultra driving a wedge between you and them. The more isolated you become, the better. We will then, as you enter this period of devaluation, start to complain regularly in order to stop you doing things, in order to upset you, in order to control you, and to draw fuel from you. And don't you dare complain about any of it. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.